extremely farcical superhero comedy based on the Flaming Carrot book from Dark Horse, made during that short period where it was uncertain what the future of the superhero movie would be. Just two years earlier, we had Batman and Robin, a movie that not only has been the butt of jokes in six billion YouTube videos, but which, at the time of its release, made comic book fans nervous as to whether filmmakers and general audiences would ever really take a comic book movie with any depth seriously. After Batman in 89, it looked like the genre might start getting some credibility at the box office again. And while admittedly not without its own silly aspects and a plot that becomes pretty nonsensical, especially toward the end, Batman was a step in the right direction to show audiences and executives that there were characters and stories in comic books worth exploring. The problem, of course, is that some movies just wanted to be Batman rather than push the envelopes of the genre along, and the marketing for those films, more and more, began targeting younger kids. A lot of superhero movies were released that weren't successful or well-received, some too formulaic, like Steel, and some just marketed incorrectly, like The Shadow. So when the franchise that breathed new life into the subgenre took a turn for the ultra-campy, it looked like superheroes might be on their way out, until they were revitalized again just a few years later with Blade, X-Men, and then solidified with the wild success of Spider-Man. Mystery Men is hard evidence of the then-waning interest in the over-the-top silly superhero movie, which was a box office flop, only managing to rake in about $30 million in total domestically. But a good chunk of those who bothered to see it really enjoyed it, and several critics wrote favorable reviews. It wasn't an illogical move to release something like this in 1999. It wasn't clear if viewers were ready for deeper, more character-driven comic book movies yet, but they did seem to be sick of the stupid ones. So rather than make this a, quote, superhero movie, why not instead make something that falls more in the genre of quirky farce that just happens to be about superheroes, and make fun of all the silly and ridiculous motifs in all those other movies and in superhero properties in general? I mean, it obviously didn't work because nobody at the time saw it, but I can see why this movie was made when it was. Honestly, I think all it really needed to sell more tickets was the Flaming Carrot. A movie like this isn't about the story so much as it is about the jokes, so if the comic beats are scoring with the audience and what story there is doesn't fall apart at the seams, it's a good movie. If they're not, then it has very little else to fall back on. I've said this before about other parodies. The rules are different because the goal isn't to tell a character-driven story so much as to entertain the audience with a lot of ridiculous outlandish gags, using the plot as a framework to place them in. The plot is very simple. A group of wannabe superheroes keeps trying to fight crime, but Champion City's real hero, Captain Amazing, has wiped out most of the crime, so there's not much for them to do. But the citizens' interest in Captain Amazing is starting to wane, just as moviegoers' interest in superhero movies. Isn't that interesting? And he's starting to lose his corporate sponsors. See, it's more about the money and fame now for him than it is about saving people. So he uses his secret identity to make sure his arch-enemy, Casanova Frankenstein, gets paroled out of jail. Casanova kidnaps him and plans to use his doomsday machine to destroy the city, so our wannabe hero recruit others to stop him. In the process, they learn to work as a team, and though they accidentally get Captain Amazing killed in the process, they defeat Casanova and his minions and earn credibility as real superheroes. Somewhat like the Tick, this is a universe where the lines between real superheroes and wannabes is kind of blurred. Captain Amazing may be kind of a moron and his motives may be selfish, but he has actual superpowers and he gets the job done. Many of the others who put on costumes have abilities that barely count as superpowers, or they can't even prove they have powers at all, but they still get to call themselves superheroes because, well, no one's stopping them. A lot of the comedy is derived from this idea as we meet one ridiculous costume character after another, and you have to wonder how some of their powers would be useful at all against a supervillain, and most of which you'd never bother reading a comic book about. The three founding members of the team, which they spend all movies movie trying to come up with a name for, are Mr. Furious, who allegedly gets super strength when he builds up enough rage, but no one's actually seen him do it, the Shoveler, who's really handy with a shovel, and my personal favorite, the Blue Raja, whose costume has almost no blue in it, fakes a British accent except for when his mother is around and throws silverware at people, but never knives. We're told the Shoveler's been doing this for 12 years, and we can only assume that the other two, being friends for a long time, have been at it for nearly as long. Each of them has an unsatisfying home life. Raja lives with his mother, who doesn't understand him. Furious lives alone and hates his job repairing vehicles. And the Shoveler is at odds with his wife, who complains that she and their kids are worried about him, and she wishes he'd give up being a superhero. When it starts really taking over his whole life, she even threatens to divorce him. She has a line early on that really illustrates how useless the Shoveler feels, and by extension, how his friends feel, too. The Shoveler comedically says, I shovel well. I shovel very well. And his wife responds with, That doesn't make you a superhero. You're a good husband and a good father, and nothing more. These three are, for the most part, our protagonists, though more and more characters are added as it progresses, who I'll talk about a little later. The film is a bit clunky in its focus, as every character has either a mini-arc or a big grandstanding moment. Enough time is spent with Furious as opposed to Raja and the Shoveler that it feels like perhaps he's supposed to be the main protagonist. 
particularly because it takes him longer to come to terms with his insecurities than it does the other two, really up until the climax. And it's odd that while it feels like eventually Furious will become the team's leader, it's the Shoveler who has the big motivational speech to get all the superheroes to commit to going up against Casanova at the end. The big resolution of Furious's character arc is really brought to the forefront, but really all three of them come to the same place at one point or another. They all learn that they aren't really superheroes, and coming to terms with that is necessary for them to actually get serious about it, or at least comparatively serious in this world, and accomplish something beyond putting on costumes and spewing cute, punny one-liners. Raja comes to terms in the end with the fact that he isn't really British when he finally tells his mother about his superhero identity, but he has newfound courage when she's impressed with his accent and, surprisingly, decides he's doing something she can be proud of. And when Furious starts dating the waitress at the diner and she makes him tell her his real name, Roy, he begins to really deal with the fact that he doesn't really have any superpowers and he's just pretending. When she sees on TV that her husband helped save the city, the shoveler's wife, who told him she wouldn't be there when he got back, still threatening divorce, says, my hero. Ultimately, it becomes about accepting that they're pretending and then owning it that gives them the courage to do something actually heroic and convincing the people who care about them that even though they may not have actual superpowers or really lame superpowers, they want it bad enough they can become real heroes. The follow your dreams message is thinly veiled, but again, it's a straight up comedy and the message is there so that A, it's not just a bunch of disconnected stuff that happens, though it's in danger of becoming that toward the middle, I'll get to that later too, and B, it's making fun of superhero movies and those often have these heavy handed morals. Before they go up against Casanova Frankenstein, they spend so much of their time trying to look and sound like superheroes that they fail every time. It's all about the aesthetic. It's like a rock band who's so worried about costumes and makeup, they never practice their music, so when they get on stage, they sound terrible. They're always so worried about their motifs being consistent that nothing else matters to them. The Shoveler complains toward the beginning that Blue Raja doesn't have any blue in his costume. And when they fight the Disco Boys, they make fun of them for carrying weapons that have nothing thematically to do with their team name. They carry pipes and guns and chains, but not gold chains, which would at least fit the motif. And, of course, they then proceed to getting the crap beaten out of them. They represent fanboys who think all it takes to be a superhero is putting together a costume out of whatever you have lying around, running outside, and looking for trouble. As we see when the three start trying to recruit new members, there are a lot of wannabe heroes in Champion City, and most of them claim to have extremely useless powers, like the guy whose superpower is apparently being a ballerina. On the other hand, their hearts are in the right place. They want to help people, and they don't want anything in return. The thrill, the excitement, and knowing they've done a good thing is enough for them. Unlike Captain Amazing, the real superhero who only cares about corporate sponsors. Remember, he helped get his nemesis out of jail just so he could have some epic battles and re-energize his public image. I like the criticism of the superhero genre itself that we're getting here. By the 90s, superheroes had gotten very popular and so much merchandising was happening that it became easy to forget just what they represented in the first place. For the companies who sold them, either on television or in movies or action figures, etc., superheroes were a representation of rampant capitalism, which doesn't seem to mesh with the selflessness characters like Superman and represent. Though that's not to say no one was making a lot of money with Superman back in the 40s either. Captain Amazing, it seems to me, personifies that idea. He uses the image of a selfless and valiant protector to make a lot of money and influence society. It's funny then that while our hero's hearts seem to be more or less in the right place, they try to go about it like Captain Amazing because that's the model they know. He's why their focus is all on image. They, like the rest of society, have bought into what Amazing is selling. These three, of course, aren't the only superheroes in the film, though I think it would be less clunky if they were the entire team, or else if some of the other recruits had a lot less screen time. Most of them are hilarious, but because so much of the dialogue is ad-libbed and each has to have his big character moment, it feels pretty disorganized, at least during that middle hour. Most of the actual story, by the way, seems to be in the first and last half hours, and then a lot of meandering and loose jokes take up the other hour. And yes, this is a movie about the jokes, but they're a lot funnier in the context of story, even if the story isn't especially complex or character-driven. For instance, I love a lot of the gags during the section where the Sphinx trains the wannabe heroes in the running joke of his formulaic advice, where the solution is always just the reverse of the problem. Things like, when you care for what is outside, the outside cares for you. Which is hilarious, because it's how he justifies spending so much time making their new costumes with electric sewing machines out in the forest. And he has one of my favorite lines in the whole film. You must lash out with every limb, like the octopus who plays the drums. But this section still drags on too long and the pacing suffers. A lot of comedy mileage comes from poking fun at familiar superhero tropes. I love especially how the Shoveler takes everything at face value and just believes the rules of a comic book universe as if they're the same as the laws of physics. One of the best gags is when Shoveler and Furious are arguing about whether Captain Amazing and billionaire Lance Hunt are the same person. Furious says they are, like it's completely obvious, but Shoveler doesn't understand how that's possible. Captain Amazing doesn't wear glasses, he says. 
He takes them off when he transforms, replies Furious. And then Shoveler says, that doesn't make any sense. He wouldn't be able to see. Another great gag along those lines comes in the very last scene when a familiar moment is turned on its head. The superheroes are being interviewed on the news, and they're asked what the team name is. They all throw out ideas, but they can't decide. The news anchor then calls them Mystery Men, in what looks like that conspicuous moment where the name comes out at random, and then they go with it, just because it's the title of the film. And then they never even consider it. The bowler even mentions that it's too cliché for the team name to be an alliteration. A lot of villain motifs are mined as well, like the master plan involving a doomsday machine that must go off at midnight for no good reason, and the villain who has the superhero tied up in his lair but he won't kill him until the doomsday machine goes off because it's more dramatic that way. This, by the way, is also turned on its head when our wannabe superheroes accidentally throw a switch on the device that kills Captain Amazing, and that's why they must now save the day. Another villain motif that's made fun of a lot in this is gangs of thugs with stupid themes. Some, but not all, include the frat boys, the disco boys, the furies, and the suits. I love the elaborate set of Casanova's lair and the disco room. It's all completely pointless and unnecessary, and it's hilarious. The movie encapsulates its long-running string of jibes about formulaic superhero stories at the denouement, when Castanova reveals he's kidnapped Furious's new girlfriend and says, it's so easy to get the best of people when they care about each other which is why evil will always have the edge. You good guys are always so bound by the rules. But ironically, Casanova is just as predictable, with his formulaic doomsday machine plot combined with a classic steal the hero's girlfriend plot, and our heroes don't seem to catch on to this. They do, however, defeat him by discovering the power of teamwork, the sort of obvious and cheesy moral you'd expect in a comedy like this. And it's funny because it's so obvious. Casanova is used to the predictability of fighting one hero, and remember, that's how he captured Captain Amazing in the first place. Who knows where all his weapons are all over his costumes until, pretending to be this predictable himself, Casanova pulls out a chloroform shooting device Amazing didn't expect. But he's not used to fighting a whole team and certainly doesn't expect their secret weapon, the bowler, and the flying bowling ball with the skull and spirit of her dead father. <laughs> and who would? Nearly all the additional heroes are funny, even if they sometimes get in the way. I especially like the invisible boy, who has the power to turn invisible, but only when no one's looking at him. Furious and the others almost refuse to let him join the team, assuming he doesn't really have any powers at all. And then he guilt trips them into it by giving them a stirring speech about being a kid and having a dream. That scene is really funny. I found myself wondering how, even if he has that power, it could possibly be useful. And of course, he gets his big character moment in the third act when we find he really does turn invisible when no one's watching, which he's able to use to disable an automatic door. He also, for some reason, loses his clothes when he uses his power, which isn't funny at all, and I'm not really sure why that happens. The idea of a superhero's power reflecting his internal conflict or insecurities is an old idea in superhero lore, and this very invisibility metaphor is in fact done with Violet years later in The Incredibles. But it's taken to an absurd extreme here, where this guy is so unnoticed and so insecure that he's not even sure if he has a superpower. And then there's Carol, the bowler, who I mentioned earlier, with the running gag of talking to her dead father in a bowling ball. I love the joke about her father's death when she says the newspaper reported it as an accident, and then he fell down an elevator onto some bullets. I think this is the best bit of comedic timing in the movie. Blue Roger says, I always expected foul play, and Carol very seriously responds with, as have I. And Carol and her father represent another classic superhero motif, the old superhero mentoring his younger prodigy who takes on his mantle, the gag here being they always bicker and fight even though he's dead, and we only hear one side of the conversation. I've already mentioned the Sphinx, who has some amount of mental powers, and he's described several times by Raja to be not just mysterious, but terribly mysterious, as if that describes his entire power set. The only character I almost never find funny at all is the Spleen, who has the power of explosive flagellance. The movie sometimes relies on this brand of crude humor, and it's usually with the Spleen. He's gross and obnoxious, call it a taste issue, but the movie's clever enough in other places I don't think it needs to reduce itself to this kind of adolescent humor. The one moment with him I actually did kind of laugh at is when the team is at a bar and he's hitting on Carol, and she says very apologetically, I'm sorry, Spleen, but there's not enough beer in the world. It's the kind of comedy that, rather than having a really tight script and eliminating the extraneous bits and the least funny gags, relies on its actors to create a lot of the comedy on the spot. It's as if it knows certain parts aren't working as well as others, but it keeps throwing a lot of different kinds of jokes at the wall and hopes most of them stick. And a good amount of them do, but I got tired of the ones that didn't. And like I said, it's about a half hour too long. Ben Stiller, William H. Macy, and the rest of the cast obviously had a blast doing this. And it looks like the kind of thing that may be a little more fun to make than it is to watch. I'm giving Mystery Men a 2.5 out of 4. Ba, ba.